accounts, it can be in your Azure. Azure has a container registry. It seems like everyone's got a container registry, huh? You, as long as you can have access to it and you reference it here, it will pull that image at that point in time. And then I'm saying this image, this container, when it runs based on this image, I'm going to give it a static IP address. And I'm going to say it depends on database, which I'm going to put in the uh, inside compose file as well. And the database is also going to have an IP address, a IP address. So which is, this is pretty cool because as a dev, I can now have host bindings on my machine. So this IP address evaluates to a URL. So uh, my awesome WCF can evaluate as a DNS to this IP address on my host machine. So now when I'm interacting with it as a dev, I'm referring to that DNS entry, which is pretty cool. Uh, back in the, you know, in other systems you'd use localhost, localhost with port numbers become very obscure, like what is localhost port 8052? What app is this? So you, you know, can do some really cool IP bindings like a, uh, on your local machine. So let's just copy this dude. Uh, so we don't. So that is, so the question is, Lance, um, how does this work when, in, in relation to like Kubernetes? Yeah, so, I need to scale that. You, you, so if you want to scale inside the Docker, in, inside the debug session? Is, uh, well, or, so in this specific scenario, I'm not concerned about scale. Okay. The next one, if this works well, I'm just going to run the Compose as it is and that you would actually be able to do to scale. So that's it. as if I'm only debugging again on my image. Uh, let me do that now, then I'll go back to the other one. So this is, I want to upstand everything when I'm debugging, and the other one is I have a VM that's upstanded with scale, and I want to debug against that. Okay. Which, um, it yep. sounds like you're going to end up with two different Docker components files. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, so there, there's a couple of permutations that, that, that I'm proposing here. Yes, you, you do want to have one potential, one like master Docker file, right? But there's, as a developer, again, I'm, I'm coming from the stance of a developer, not as a tester or a ops engineer. So a, te a tester, you would want everything to be in a certain way, and that's when you would have a unified Docker uh, compose file. Uh, or as an ops engineer, I want to have, I want to just deploy this. I don't care about all these other permutations. You would have that that one proposed file. I'm coming from the stance of I'm a developer, uh, but I I have Visual Studio, and I technically only want to run one Visual Studio. But this Visual Studio project, I don't necessarily want all these projects to be uh, in a debug state just to be able to test my one function that's working. Because that, that's that's a different stance of, of, of how, how to look at this. So as your as your project starts off, it starts very simple, and then as life goes on, uh, that project it gets another project on top of it. And that solution now has two projects. Then you get another project, and eventually you get to a point where your Git repo is like four gigs worth of source files because you've had to bundle everything together to make everything work, all the microservices together. I'm proposing that. If we're in a microservice uh, environment, nothing stops you as a developer. I want to comment out these two services from my, my compose file, and because I'm only interacting with the API and the database, I don't care about the front end. Why should I? Why should I have that on my machine in the, in the first place? And that, this allows you to do that. Yep. Yeah. Because by having a static IP in your configuration, you only have that one. So if you want to have a load balance system, would you now just specify 196? And yes. So again, uh, in a, I'm not um, mentioning a load balancing scenario here. Uh, I'm just making sure everything works. But you can make it dynamic and you can use something like Kubernetes that will upstand the infrastructure for you. You can load balance it that way. Um, here, I'm just 
presenting as a developer, I want to be able to talk to WCF in a database and my API um, in that type of scenario. But yes, no, you're 100%. Um, effectively, what you'll end up doing is for this project, you would have one file with one debug, which is your compose file, and you probably have in the project root another compose file that will be for your orchestration going forward. Potentially, you'll only have two in, in, a, in a fairly decent way. The alternative is you actually dump the, the debug one and you just have the one main one, but then you would need to understand that you would have to, you would, you would be upstanding the entire infrastructure to be able to do that. Okay. I'm just going to jump in there. You can also point your Docker Compose file to an actual DHCP pool if you want to do something like that. So mm -hmm. if you want to have one of those scenarios where mm -hmm. you want to take it from your dev machine through to your staging site, you can actually point it to an actual pool and say, pull in an address from here and it will pull a address. But now you need to make sure that pool is fully uh, dynamic and doesn't have any reservations or anything like that. Because then you're going to start problems when, if you run a container and it pulls an IP address and it doesn't release that, that IP address, you're going to start having problems in that pool. But you can actually set up your compose to actually upstand things dynamically with dynamic IP addresses. But for a debugging scenario, it doesn't really, it's not really necessary. You can do it, but is there a need? Do you connect to a DOC pool, use that network resource, pull down those network resources, and then try and go back and forth? Cool feature about Visual Studio. <laughs> uh, they've actually improved the, the debugging of your containers in terms of uh, formatting. So it doesn't like the way the formatting is on the Docker file because uh, the Docker file is very uh, similar to Python, it's space sensitive. <coughs> so if, effectively, all that's going to happen, I need to fix it. But it's going to upstand those three. So I'm going to run this other composed file. Copy and paste it from uh, VS Code into Visual Studio. Sorry, your question is? Uh, I think it's Control KF to auto format. Oh, okay. Let me give it a go. We select all. Control K. Control K. Control. Okay. Control K. Control K. Again, I'm, I'm only being into it. Sorry. The key combination is control K, control F, follow the key. It's not like you.
So uh, because I have a compose file, I can run it outside uh, Visual Studio as well, because it originally came from Docker installs. So effectively, I'm saying doc compose up means upstand this information. Dash D is detach. So it runs through the settings or the services that are specified in my file. Right session is frozen. Effectively, I'm running this this configuration, which is the database and the WCF together, and this would be um, the scenario of if I have some code that relies on these two items to be running, and I have access to it. Um, and I'll, I have some code that I want to debug against that infrastructure. Instead of having a virtual machine to have this two resources, I have stand on my machine. Yes. Okay, so those are two running. This is create web, pool, inspect, gets me the IP address, off it goes. Here's my debug session as it usually does. <coughs> the end of it, but that is, to answer your question, that is a real world example as a developer, I, instead of having a virtual machine, which I mentioned in the beginning, uh, that I need to have a certain state, I've actually imposed my state on my virtual on my local machine, and I have my code base that needs to talk to this infrastructure, um, and I can do it locally without having anyone else, anyone else dirtying my infrastructure, and when I'm done, even if I've broken it, no one else has my broken changes. I can shut it down again, re-stand it up again. If I had, a, like I have this database, I can attach a database, a SQL database. Now I'm talking to a SQL database at this instance, so it's not my SQL. I can attach an MDF file, so I can have pre-populated data, I can have a hydration script that will actually take this data and change it the way I want to on debug or on compose up. You can have scripts that do that. And now my debug infrastructure is the way I want it, and I can carry on working. No, no, I can share this so as a local port, so if I clear with my networking, I can expose my local Docker NAT from outside into mine, so I can share it with someone else if I want to debug my same session, but ideally you want them to run their own compose file. Cool. Yes? So the, the question is, if I understand you correctly, how do I persist and manage persistence inside and outside of a container? Yeah. Uh, use, them, uh, use volumes for that. So um, a container at its running state, um, you have access to the file system within its context, so inside the container. Whatever you write and save and stuff like that in a running or stop container stays there. The moment you delete the container by saying RM, we do a, a Docker system prune and delete the container completely, that file system gets cleared out and you lose that persistence. When you do a, 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 a volume, which is a, effectively a, a volume share or mount right. in, in, the, in the Linux way, you actually bi-directionally share that, that, that persistence. So that sort of just maps a yes. directory like in your file system to the Exactly, 100%. And that is available on Windows and on Linux. 
And if you're running a Windows host and you have a Linux container, you, there is a, a, a feature inside the CLI, the, the Docker client, that you tell it, hey, please share this folder, map this folder, the same way you do with VMs. And then it asks you, prompts you if you, if you need admin rights, it'll ask you for the password. It saves it for that session of your Windows token, and then it allows that bidirectional saving between the VM, the Mobi VM, which is a Linux container, and your host file system. Cool. And you can uh, save your logs in that volume, yes. not on the default. Yes, correct. And that is both on debug or in production. In production, you would volume mount with a, a volume share so that you can move that share around, uh, but then you'll you have your application right to that volume mount, and then you'll be able to pull out those logs. Anything else? So that's, that's how you do the database uh, yes. sample as well. Yes. Um, I've, I've still, personally, I need to still come around on, on how to load balance the database. I'm not 100% how, because effectively you're still writing to a file, so therefore you've got file locking. So I'm not sure how, how it gets solved, but effectively that's it's exactly how you do it. The unsolved problem is not Yeah. Because I mean, in, in Bucket Picture, you usually have like a master and a slave. Yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting space. I, I think a little bit more. I know I need to still learn a little bit more about that kind of thing as well. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. So when you kill. A running Docker image. Yes. Uh, you said it's, it's persistent within that image at the mm. time. Does it remain persistent for you to start up again, or is it wiped? Because you use you said the rm command will wipe the file system. So if I stop it, can I start it again? Yes. Yeah. And it remains persistent. If you stop, so you just stop the container. Yes, you can run it again, and it carries on where it was. You can um, if you willingly want to stop and you want to persist this whole session and you want to delete it but you still want to run it in that configuration and that with those files that you send out database there's a command called commit um, in docker so you can say docker, uh, docker container commit and you give it a tag and effectively you create a new image with that whole so effectively you snapshot it uh, and then you can push it into a repository clean up your container and then when you run that specific tag you continue from that point onwards again. Um, the only time, personally, I'll, I've actually seen it used successfully is when you're working with databases and stuff like that, and effectively snapshots the database in a certain configuration without any hydration scripts, and you want to continue, you would use something like that. But in an application like a web API, it's kind of a wasted commit because you can actually have your build system create the application. Again. Makes sense. Cool. Anything else? Lance, anything from you guys? Uh, Andre, Chris? Yep, all good for me, thank you. Okay, cool. So, if I may ask, be so bold ask, what was good and what would you like to see next if you had to come again? I, I, I was hoping you, Dr. Um, <coughs> Compose has the DB and the service, am I right? Yes, my last example, yes. So when you add a service to a website that you get there, you uh, it's that little feature that you need to service to something. Yes. And how would that work out if you want to put all the three service components into the bucket, the DB and service and the site? How would you sort of add the service to the site that you put the compose In a debug session. So you you compose you put it in the compose, but now you want to debug to actually discover the service. Yes. I don't think you can, <laughs> because I think the tool Visual Studio once you've attached the debugger to Visual Studio, it doesn't allow you to add connected services. So the way I got around that is running it separately, add the connected service, so I can get the contract. You can still you you'll still be able to attach the debugger to the running service once it's in your compose file. So you can still debug to the WC service. But to create the contracts for that feature in Visual Studio, it needs to talk to a running uh, service. So you can run that, create a container that runs it, and then just so you can get the contracts. Um, 
that's the thing that I, I found that would do that. Yes, yes. So it's only exposed when it's, when it's executing. No. Anything else? Okay. Um, so you spun up like a thousand uh, instances. Uh, do they all share the same menu space for a spot or the allocate per instance? So you can do both. Um, so if you don't specify it, uh, you're leveraging off a CLI to allocate memory onto the containers, but you can, uh, there's a, uh, the same way I specify the IP address, you, there's a flag to specify the memory and the storage as well, and the CPU for every single container. So you could effectively give one container 10 gigs of RAM and another one 1 gig of RAM, just to see how they behave in that type of scenario. I, I get you, and I, I totally agree with you. Um, our next next month, so we're trying to leverage this every month. Uh, so we had one last month. We had an intro to Kubernetes, um, which is an orchest orchestrator. Um, before we went over to the next orchestrator, it was perceived that it might be a good idea to come from a developer's point of view to get some buy-in from the developers. That's why I did this one today. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the next month's one will be um, an engineer from Rancher in the States will be uh, connecting to us via Skype and he'll do a presentation on, on orchestration. And effectively, uh, once your container is running, you would need to have an orchestrator to be able to manage it. So you can, nothing stops you from going onto a VM, say Docker run and, yeah. and leave it. Uh, 